on a xy coordinate system. You have y to minus y one exactly, square and x to minus x one square. So you have gene x and gene o, sorry, gene y and gene x. It could be gene x either way. So gene y, gene x. You have this sample one from these two, sample two, and then you have sample three, and so on and so forth. So now you calculate the distance between these two samples, and you get this value of x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 square, and I need to do a square. Right? Same thing. So this distance is let's say it's d1, and then you do this distance, this is d2, and then you do this distance, this is d3. Correct? Yes. So now you can actually compare how far a sample, the distance between S1, 2 is equal to D1, S2, 3 is equal to D3, S1, 3 is equal to D2. Now depending on how, how, how close or how far they are, you can just know that, okay, D1, D1 is less than D, um, D3. Um, and so you can claim that S1 is closer to S2, right? So now if you had, um, if you had to plot them, you would just basically plot them like, oh, this is the uh, S1, S2 in one cluster, and then you have S3. And that's exactly how clustering works. Okay. Instead of now calculating the distance under with two genes, you can calculate the distance from between samples now. Let's say there are three genes. So the distance now becomes a three-dimensional distance because you have three points for each gene. So how do you calculate the distance in uh, if you have three points? If you have x, y, and z, so instead of x and y, now you have another x, y, and z. Do you remember? So you calculate x. So let's say s2 is sample 2, s1 is sample 1. s2 is x2, y2, z2. And then, so that is basically gene 2, uh, gene 1, <coughs> gene 1 value, gene 2 value, gene 3. And you have uh, x1, y1, z1. And the distance is x2 minus x1 plus y2 minus y1, so far so good, plus z2 minus z1, a square. Except now, instead of taking a square root, you take a cube root. You take a third root. So if you have n, then you take the x2 minus x1 to y2 and minus y1, and let's just keep going like that, z, 2 minus z1, and you can go to a2 minus a1, and keep going for all the genes that you have, and then you just take, uh, so these are all squares, and you're just going to take 1 by n of that. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay? Yes. So, so, so that's exactly what you're going to do here uh, when you have, and you're trying to calculate the distance. Now, for every sample, you get a distance now, S1, S2, you get a distance. And pairwise distance is what you're getting for every sample to the other. And that's what you're plotting as part of the distance matrix. So when you plot the distance matrix, that is that distance that you've calculated from 20,000 genes between each sample and the other. Okay? So that's what you're calculating here. And you're plotting that. And so that is this guy. So the genes that are, uh, the samples that are closer, you can see these two samples are closer. And then these two samples are closer. You don't know which ones they are because you can't read them in your case. But if, 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 uh, you know, if you look at them, they're forming these clusters. That cluster is forming based on the distance, which I just explained to you how you calculate. No, they're actually sample to sample. So it's a distance pairwise matrix. It's a pairwise matrix. 
So the samples here are the same as the samples here. You just look at one side above the diagonal or below the diagonal because it's pairwise. You want to calculate the distance between every single pair to every other pair. Do you understand? Because if you have three samples, that's why you have D1, D2, D3. You have the difference between 1 and 2. You have the distance between 2 and 3. And then you have distance between 1 and 3. Here you have eight samples. So you have the distance of this to every other sample. And then here you have the distance from this to every other sample including. What is the diagonal? The diagonal is the distance between the, the sample to itself, which is always 1. So that's the, that's the highest you will get. That's why that shade is different. It's always the darkest. So the smaller the distance, the darker the, the color? The right. Color. Either that or inverse. But basically, you can, you know, uh, the smaller the distance, the, yes, the darker the color in this case. Yes. Because the, the, it's, it's one at the darkest. Okay. So the closer you are, the, the more it is. Otherwise, you can see it gets lighter. So like for this sample, it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter. All right? It's a symmetrical. Yeah, because the, everything the here same. is the same as everything here. Yeah. Uh, because it's a distance matrix. It's n by n. OK? <coughs> OK. So good. Glad I could clarify that. Um, uh, pretty much the rest of this, again, is you're taking uh, uh, this if you do an assay on the RLD object, which is the log on normalized, you get your variance stabilized data. Um, and then you can get your standard deviation across that variance stabilized data. And then you take the top 1,000 genes, or 100, depending on what that number is. Uh, you take the top genes. And then for that, you calculate the standard deviation across all rows. Um, so here, take the top 1,000 genes. And then you just go ahead and keep plotting these things in your uh, using BSW Clust. So this is your example, the first example of your plot for BSW Clust. All right, and that would look something. Yeah, you can't see it. I'm, I'm having this issue. I don't know why it's. Well, you won't see it yet. It's, it's still working on it. No, because there is no nothing showing a, yeah, a crosser on one of those things. Oh, see. right, right, right. Because the next, the rest of the stuff has. And it will also export to PDF. PDF, yes, yes, yes. You're right. Oh, here. So it's gonna part. Um, save it in the PDF file, <coughs> and that PDF file is here, uh, here. Okay. So this is your first file output, and uh, it just again... Okay, so R. Um, Today we're going to start off first by installing Ben um, BSW Plus and all those other packages. And the way to do that is to go in the download and go under Dock. In there you have this. Um, sorry, actually, go under Packages. And you have the README file. All right. So the README file just gives you the order in which you have to install stuff. So the first package to install is BSW UDI. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, you want to go under Tools, Install Packages. All right? So we're going to go over to Tools, Install Packages. And then we're going to click that. And at that point, it gives you this option of Installing From. You're going to click down the Install From and select the Package Archive, at which point you will browse to the location where you downloaded your materials for this package. So in that folder 2018, 11, 13, under packages, you're going to select which package? UDI, because that's the first one to install. 
Select that package and click open. Uh, then you click install. Where is that? The UDI 1.2. The UDI package is this one. It would be, so the, this is the order. UDI, util, plot, grid, plus, and feed. First thing is this UDI, this one, which says 1.2. Yes. yes. So click that and click install. And then it should do the installation without any errors. Once you have done with that, then you again do the next packet installation, which now is util. So same thing again, tools, install packages, browse, um, util, open, install. Done. Again, next package to install is the plot package. So you're going to go tools, install packages, browse, VSW plot, open, install. Now in some cases, it might actually say um, you need some other package like vSwarm or something else. Whichever package it saves, you use the installation console under tools, install packages, and let's say it says you need to install vSwarm, right? Does anybody get any error saying you need to install? Where are those packages? Where are they? Why should I download those? Those packages are on the website. <coughs> if you haven't yet downloaded them from uh, the website, it, it is on intro to bioinformatics.com under uh, heat maps and uh, counting. Oh, it's under heat maps. Okay. It's under the heat maps because we're making heat maps with this package. So. So we, we kept it there. So, uh, so I'm gonna. Um, so whatever package it says that you need to install BSW plot, in that case you go to same thing, install the package. But now you're gonna go to the repository and search for that package name. For example, let's say you want to search for bswarm. So it comes up right here. All right. So you select that and then you click on install. Make sure your dependencies is checked. So the dependencies box, as long as that is checked, it's going to install all your dependencies as well. All right? So. It doesn't say anything. Okay, so if it is installs perfectly, then you don't need to worry. Then you're good. Then the next package to install after your BSW util is BSW plot. After that, um, I believe it's grid and cluster. So first install BSW grid. Go ahead and install that. And then install BSW clust. And finally the last package to install is BSW heat. Tools, install packages. Install BSW heat. Boom. If everything has done, has been installed for it correctly, you should be able to go ahead and then go library BSW plus 10 and it should work. If you were to go and execute this line BSW plus 10. So this is the file from yesterday, the FA 2018 VC tutorial version 2. Point, version 2.r. Now, I'll pause for a second and let you guys tell me where you are. Are you getting errors? So yeah, that's what I meant when you said that you need to install dependencies, right? Yeah, I so, did. No, no, no. It's, not that. it's saying BioPlot is not available for the HW. So you need to install the BioPlot. How do you do that? You go there, Tools, Install Packages, you go to Chrome, you search for BioPlot. And you say so. And say yes. Yes. Okay, so SN is not available. So then you go and say, all right, let me install the package SN. So. Right. 
compilation fails for this. Uh, right. This error. Some code for R packages is written in Fortran, which is one of the most ancient packages. And the R was quite ancient now. Which is why some packages have a code written in Fortran, because it's been engineering from uh -huh. centuries ago. So what you do is, <laughs> when I'm in centuries, maybe like a couple of decades, 50 years, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> then you download this shit, okay. and then you install it. After installation of Xcode, you will be able to run the, and install the SM. SM first. If that still doesn't work, then we have a different one. Okay. But normally, that installation should.
are you guys doing? Were you able to install? Same SM. SM? Mm. Um, uh, Download you, the S code back. Install. Um, yeah, we'll try and do that, and then if that did it work? If you don't compile, mm -hmm. you just say okay, no. Yeah. It will go through. It will. Yeah, I just need that. Right. So if it ask you for if you're gonna help from the source. Yes, so no, or no. cancel. I said no, and then go through. That's perfect. That's what we want. Then. Thank you for having that. <laughs> for some reason, I always take up the challenge. Eventually, I was able to install from source. <laughs> okay, so I don't know what happened. To that, so that's a problem. Still. Yeah, that SM problem is not. Okay. And that this oh. install. And then you can see no problem. Yeah. Well, I think we're running into an issue. Probably because yeah, basically plot it down with the soft probe, right? Yeah. And this is all Mac. Okay. So it is done. And now you just go forward with the rest. Yeah. All right. So for thanks for SM, um, just click no. Yeah. So if you get an error with SM, then whoever is watching this video, just click. If you want to install from source, click no, and then it works. And then the rest of the packages get installed as well. Yes, that is awesome. And start loading these libraries and these packages and start following the instructions here. I will start running the stuff from here as well. So you start with removing everything. This command, what does this do? Um, this removes everything in your memory, starts off fresh, and then you load these packages, including the package Venn diagram. So load all of those packages. If you find that you don't have any of these, then go ahead and install that. So make sure you're done till li line 21. If while you're executing till line 21, if you get an error, then uh, just install that package. Okay. I have an error in the device all. Yeah, mine too. In what? Can't sh shut down device one. Safety. Oh, okay, don't worry. That's fine. It just means that you don't have a device open. That? Okay. That's fine. It's it's more of a preemptive thing in case you have a device open, it just closes it, so you're done. But if you don't, that's fine. Don't worry. Okay. All right. Um, were you able to load the packages? Yes. yes. Uh, I've got error in map. In what? P heat map, beat map. P heat map. Yeah. Um, then install that packages, P heat map. Go There's to. There's no package called P heat map, so install it. Um, just look online. Is it part of uh, what's, what is it part of bioprotector? If that is, no, it's in CRAN. Yeah, it's in CRAN, I got it. So then just install that packages from CRAN. Okay. Okay, so we're going to start with the practical now. Um, and again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through this. Okay. One, two, three eyes on me. And then we're going to then, uh, you're going to do it on your, on your own. All right? And then I'll walk around. That way the video is continuous and people don't have to wait, <laughs> whoever's watching. All right. So first things first, uh, we just say date assist on date. Just another, you know, check in case we want to add the date somewhere, today's date. Um, now we're going to change our directory to the directory where our stuff is. For example, where did we put our data files and materials, and that is in this directory. It's up to you where you store it, but this path has to reflect that. So let's do that. So that we set our working directory. Now we're going to read this raw reads table. You know, that's right here. Um, let's take a quick look at how it looks. You can do a oops. You can do a, a, a head on data. And you're able to see that this now looks like this. It has all your samples from 1 to 15. Uh, next thing we're going to do is we are going to select the rows that we don't want. So these are our drop, the rows that we want to drop. Um, and we're just going to search for them using this 
apply s apply. Uh, so we started apply functions. I know this is a little of a complex one, but let me break it down. What you're saying is let's call the grep l function, which grabs for in individual each of these uh, elements in this. Uh, so whatever is in this HTC drop vector, we're going to grab that and whatever rows it occurs in in data, in the row names data that uh, match this, we're going to keep track of that using this vector drop. So store them in drop. And then finally, if you were to print this out, it's, it's going to be a really long uh, true or false vector. So, but, uh, so true or false meaning that whatever is uh, false, that does not contain any of these elements, whatever is true contains. So if you do a table on uh, drop, there are 97 values that are true and the rest are false. Meaning there are 97 rows that contain anything like no feature, ambiguous, too low quality, not aligned, and so on. So we want to remove those. We do that by this line where we delete the rows we don't want. And then we read in the sample info. Now this is just a metadata about our samples. What do our samples look like? What is the condition for each sample? What is the hour experiment? All right. Now, in this case, we're interested in the hour three only. So, and for those that are in hour three, in the dose response, we want to study the none versus all the other conditions. So, what we're going to do is we are going to manually select for those by saying take these rows eight to fifteen, which is these rows. You could also say. I uh, you could also select these, take, uh, instead of saying take these, you could say whatever hour is equal to three, you select those rows, okay? All right. Uh, as for the other two things, we're just converting these uh, uh, columns, the hour column and experiment column into factors. And by now, I hope everybody understands what factors are. So here you have two factors, one and three, and you have the same thing for experiment, you have two factors, one and two, all right? So we convert these to factors just because we're gonna, we may need them later. Uh, we say we want 8 to 15. We can go sample data is data, take the, these. Or you can segment it whatever way you want so as to get only those columns or those samples you're interested in. Okay, uh, the next few lines uh, that we go through here, this one selects your data. Uh, for the experiment and condition, again, we're only taking those um, uh, uh, experiments that we're interested in, which is in this case happens to be two, and conditions which also happens to be uh, none, high, medium, and low, but for samples 8 to 15. So we're selecting those samples. Uh, same thing for our, uh, and, uh, and this is, uh, again, um, this additional step is to remove the rows which have um, low read counts. And the way you do that is by saying, if the row sums is greater than, say, a certain number, in this case, we're using the number as the length of the sample. So the total number of samples, which happens to be eight, if the number of reads in every row is greater than eight, we're gonna keep those rows. If not, we're gonna remove those rows, okay? All right? Um, if you're ever confused, you can always do a table and see how many uh, are there. So in this case, it looks like everything is going to be included. Maybe it was done before, that's why. <laughs> um, actually, here we can do this by saying data. I won't get a better picture. So there you go. So there's 26,000 rows in data that are greater than or equal to. And so we keep those. Um, OK. All right. So next thing we want to do is we want to create an experimental design. This part is actually very important. So I'd like you to look at this part. So what you're doing is you're creating a design for your experiment where you create, which is basically a data frame that holds your experiment uh, information, uh, like what sample is what and what is, um, here, it's best explained if you just look at it. So, you know, condition, experiment, hour. Very similar to what you had in your original info file, right? But you can also create this manually by adding this information like this. You can create vectors, condition, experiment, hour manually and then uh, combine them to create this data frame. Okay. So, so far, questions? Any questions? No? Questions?
There's only four of you. I'm going to ask every single one of you. Until <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I guess my question is that here, experiment design yeah, yeah. equals to data frame. Yeah. And you specify that row names is the a previous column name. Yes. And then um, R will automatically know conditions and experiment and hour will put into the column name. Is it true? Um, no, so these are all just vectors. So you can create this. If you look at condition, this is a separate vector. If you look at experiment, it's a separate vector. And hour is a separate vector. All of these vectors are created right here when you are creating these guys. Yes, I understand that. Right. So then row names is column names of sample data. So all we're interested in is we, we are taking four vectors and combining them into one data frame. So we put all of these together, and then that becomes this guy. All right. So we're just creating a data frame. Uh, and yes, uh, when we say row names is equal to this, means that you're creating a new data frame whose row names is this. And then there are three columns in that condition, experiment, and hour. Cool? All right. So, uh, so you can read the comments here. Uh, one thing we want to do is right now the condition column does not is not a factor, so we're going to create that into a factor. Uh, when we do that, um, here's an interesting thing to note. If you were to just do this, and uh, um, if you look at the the levels, they go from high, low, medium, none. I explained yesterday we want the order to be none, low, medium, high, because we want the none as the first one to which we compare all the others. All right? So if we want the none to be uh, this, then we have to specify explicitly what order the levels need to be. And that's what we do. All right, so now if you look at this experiment dollar condition, then the levels are in the order in which we want them to be. Okay? Why not an as factor? Um, as dot factor. I think they would be the same thing, so okay. I don't think it would make a difference if you were to do that. Oh, name, no. Uh, so as our factor uses just one argument, which is a vector, so it's not going to take the levels argument. So factor, it looks like factor is able to accommodate for it because you're creating a new factor. All right? And so that's why we do that. But if you had an existing vector and you just wanted to factorize it, you could use as one factor. Uh, all right, so at that point, we're ready to call dseq's first function, which is to create a dseq object. Um, this, in this case, we need a few inputs to this. The first one is your count matrix. That's the first one. The second one is your design matrix. And then specifically in the design matrix, uh, so the column data part is we're just using that for the design. And then the remaining, the main thing is this condition argument. And it follows with this tilde sign. Um, and that basically tells it that we're going to test our differential expression on this condition. OK? So that is important because that's what it uses to create the model. So we want to specify that up front. Um, you can always look at what DDS contains. It's a class of this. It contains this is dimension. This is what it contains. Okay. So after that, we're going to use this to create uh, R log, which is it's a way of same as log to normalizing our data. I talked about this yesterday. So we just want to R log this thing, um, and once it's done, we want to then use the estimate size factors function to go ahead and estimate our size factors. Um, and the whole pur purpose of this is to demonstrate um, via plots as to what happens if we do no normalization versus log to normalize versus R log. So notice we're changing the par arguments. If you remember from graphics, there was this way to, uh, to select one row and three columns so that all of your three graphs are in one uh, frame. And that's what we're utilizing here. And we call the plot function th three times. In each case, we're calling either the counts, log two of the counts, or we're to getting the counts from the RLD object using the assay. Uh, we're displaying the only two columns, one and two, in all cases. 
Um, and, uh, and that's what we're doing to see how different they look. So if you look at these three plots, sure what's going on here. Um, can you guys try it in your R console and see what happens if you were to run these? It works for me. It works for you guys, right? Um, my guess is it's going somewhere in, in I need to restart my R. Let's try this one more time. Oh, there they are. So it pops out instead of going in. In the smallest window ever. Yeah, so, so good luck finding that little guy. Which now I think I've lost again. I've minimized it and now it's lost. So is there an option to uh, output the plots in the window? I guess that's turned on. Yeah, I think you need to turn it on um, separately. Yeah, in my case, I think that's the problem. Okay, so I, I know what's going on, and I think it's lost. It, it just keeps coming up as a separate thing. This guy. <laughs> so my bar pops out. I, I have to figure this out as to why it is the case. But you get the idea <laughs> that, that that's what um, needs to be done. All right, so I'm going to keep this guy here. So everybody can see it. I'm guessing future plots are also going to be coming here. Okay. So then we're going to try and do the principal component <laughs> analysis. Um, so what we're going now is to reduce our data set and get the variance for all these uh, different components and then plot them. So this is the piece of code that does that. Um, and oh, there we go. This guy. So, so now you can see this is your principal component. Obviously, my graphics are not as nice as I would hope. So, hopefully, you can get better and you can see this uh, specifically. All right. So, after that. Um, Again, this is, these are pretty much all the same things. You're just doing log, log to transformation versus not log to and seeing everything. So this is literally just playing around with your data and seeing what kind of plots you get. So please do that. You should get plots similar to this or otherwise. Um, 
you know, see what you get. Okay. Um, finally, this is your distance matrix calculation and distance heat maps. Um, again, very similar to what you would expect uh, from your clustering. Okay. All right. Yeah. Questions so far? I mean, is there any part of this that you would want me to explain further? Yes, maybe not relevant to this practical, but I didn't understand the get the distance map. Okay, um, so whenever you are having data, you can, um, let's say in this case the data is, for every gene, you have a value, right? Now, assuming that there were only two genes in a sample, right? So uh, one is gene X and the other one is gene Y, right? And these are the only two genes that you have and you have five samples, right? Now, um, if you were to plot each sample on its gene X and gene Y value, right? Then you get one point for each sample, right? Yes. So you could calculate, te theoretically you could calculate the distance between <coughs> sample one and sample two just based on those two the point in which they lie on those two coordinates yes correct yes right so how do you calculate the distance between two points um, oh is that is that how your computer does I updated Mojave and it just imploded oh okay I'm, 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 like I'm being very chicken also yeah, yeah. don't Mojave do it has don't do it don't do it okay. well I'm hoping this Mojave update fixes some of these issues We'll see. All right. Well, um, we're lucky to have Ben here today. Uh, ben is a is a mathematician by training, actually, but then he has been also doing a lot of bioinformatics in the last many many years. And uh, uh, over the years, he's developed some best practices and some packages that he's written. And one of them, because he's written plenty, but there's one of them in R that is for generating heat maps and. Uh, uh, and it is actually a very popular package in the Haber Lab, and a lot of publication-worthy plots are being made using this package. So I personally like it a lot. It's got some very cool features. So Ben's going to talk about that today uh, and how you can use this to make your own heat maps. It's actually very powerful. So thank you so much for coming, Ben. Sure. Uh, over to you. Okay. So first, generally talking about clustering, um, this is an example of a very common type of clustering that goes on in bioinformatics. Like typically every column is a sample, every row is a gene or feature of some sort. You make this thing and, and this dendrogram and the colors here represent like the different groups and how they're how they're similar to one another or not. It's quite quite common. Um, so there's two types of clustering. One is called supervised. An example of that is k-means, and um, here's an example of some data, just these, these points in the, in the two-dimensional space. Um, if you want, you can imagine this is gene one and gene, gene one expression and gene two expression. Um, if you tell k-means there are four clusters, what are they? They will come back and say, here, there are the four clusters. If you tell it there are three clusters, it, it will say, okay, so here's one cluster, and here's another, and here's another. It will give you three. If you say, give me three, it will give you If you say, give me five, it will give you one, two, three, four, five. So that's, that's what's meant by uh, supervised clustering, where you specify how many clusters you want, and the program figures out how to do it. Now, so in the, in, the, in the previous example, it was easy to look at it and say, well, I see four clusters. And it's often a question of how many clusters are there? Or do we have um, multiple clusters? Do we have, is there structure here? And I first want to make the claim that the question of how many clusters are there in this data is not a really well-posed question. So for example, look at this data here. You could easily say there's three classes, 
So one cluster, another, and another, that's three. Or you might say, well, no, these two are, there's other structures. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's reasonable as well. There's just no right answer to this question. How many clusters are there in this picture? But what's more, there's also a hierarchical structure. At, at a certain level, there's three. But then when you go into any one of them, you might find four or three or two. And so that's why um, it's often done this way. Um, so I've taken the x and y data of these points, and I put it here as, as uh, represented by a color. It's a number from here to there. So here's the x and y data for each sample. And if you, if you ask a hierarchical clustering program to cluster this for you, um, it says, well, <coughs> this one always breaks things into twos. But if you look at this, you can say, well, there's three <coughs> kind of big groups that it's made. And each, each one of these big groups has subgroups that have the, you know, the structure that, that we were just talking about. So the idea of, of, of a hierarchical clustering is that there are multiple levels at which you can look at it. So you can look at it and say, I see three. Or you can look at each one of those three and say, oh, I see four in here. So here's I see, I see two or I see three, depending on how you want to look at it. But within this, I see more structure. So, so that's, that's the, what, why, why people do hierarchical clustering, is, is to not have to, to answer a perhaps unanswerable question. But we will have a little bit more to say uh, in, in this um, lesson on the question of, is there, are there are there subclusters, um, or how many clusters are there? Okay. So if you're going to make a plot like this, there's going to be a lot of questions. You have a lot of choices to make um, in 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 firing off that kind of analysis. Um, so there's, oh, let's say, roughly 25,000 genes. Um, how many of those do you want to put on your plot? I mean, obviously, if, if some of your genes are just zero all the way across, you don't want those. Maybe you don't want to, to fill up your plot with genes that are just very lowly expressed, and so forth. So um, that's, okay, we're going to get into this in more detail later. And we're going to get into more detail on all of these things. So we're going we're to discuss which genes, how many, how to choose, some normalization that is often done to the data, um, then there's going to be the choice of, of metrics, so how do we d define how similar the profiles are for two samples, how do we define the similarity, um, we'll talk about that. And then, once you have all these things, how do you form this dendrogram? And there are choices to be made there, and that's called the agglomerate, agglomeration method. So we're going to now go through these four things. So which genes, how to choose? Um, I often choose this, the, say, the top 2,000 genes with regard to their standard deviation across all the samples. Um, I do that because it means that there's typically the more expressed genes, say, they're going to have a, a higher standard deviation. And also, I mean, you want a difference. I mean, you could have very highly expressed genes which are very uniformly expressed and you wouldn't be interested in that gene. That, however, is theoretical. It never happens. Pretty much, the higher the standard deviation, the higher the expression. So it's not a big deal how you do this. Uh, but this is what I normally do. Um, how many genes? Um, so back in the days when I was dealing with microarray gene expression, um, I tried you know, 50, 100, 250, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And what I found was that for uh, some small number of data sets, the clustering changed substantially until I got to about 1,000 genes. After which, um, it stayed steady as I went up. Uh, and then, it, and then it's, when I got to be too much, it kind of all washed out. So like if, if I was using the top 10,000 genes or top 15,000 genes, um, the, the the structure kind of wasn't visible either. So there's a kind of somewhere from a thousand genes up to 
many thousand, you know, of genes. It was always giving it was giving me a, a nice, consistent answer. So what I now do as it's just I just take the top two thousand typically. But I just want to get a quick look at a data set, and you know other contexts might behave differently. I don't know. Um, so you could experiment just as I did. Nothing wrong with that. Okay, normalization. Um, one very popular method is called median polishing, and and uh, you don't. You, know, you wouldn't have to code this. There's code that does it for you, but you just have to decide if you want it. But what is it? One way to describe median polishing is to describe how it works. So you have so from each row you subtract its median. So now the median of each row is zero. And then you can do the same thing for each column. Now the median of each column is zero after you do that. But now you've messed it up, the medians of the rows are no longer zero. But you can subtract off the, the new median of all the rows, and, and you can go back and forth like that. And this, will, this is guaranteed to settle down. And it, it settles down into a representation where everything that's common uh, is gone, and all you've got are differences, is really the way to think about it. So um, that's the idea. You're trying to take away all, all the, anything that can be attributed to which row you're in or which column you're in. You're trying to get rid of that and have just differences. So that's um, a, a very popular thing. And I think it's what, in, in the examples I showed, that's what was done. But a lot, a lot of people do that. Um, another is just simply to do row normalization from each row, subtract its mean, and then divide by its standard deviation. So now it's like some people would call the result of that a z-score. Um, and so you might have a very highly expressed gene and a very not so highly expressed gene, but once you do row normalization, they both kind of have the same scale or same visual effect or, or, or weight in your plot. So this is if you're saying, you know, I, I just want I want to see each gene in relation to how much it's changing, and are they changing? Um, another thing that some people do, which generally I don't like, is just a scale each row linearly so that the lowest value scales to minus one and the highest to one. Um, I don't like that because it's very, um, it's uh, very sensitive to like one value, your, your highest value. It's not, it's not looking at all your data really. A little bit, but I don't like it. Um, and then another thing which I, I do often is no normalization whatsoever. And the advantage of that is um, you, under, you can understand what you're seeing. Right? If you have a heat map where the colors go from, you know, say white to red along some kind of a gradient, and you can say, you know, this is the log 10 reads per million of that gene for that sample. It's really easy to understand what the, for people to understand what's there and, um, and know whether something is like a, a bunch of genes are highly expressed or not. Whereas after you've medium polished, it can be, you can begin to wonder, am I just seeing differences? Are these really highly expressed or not? So that's, that's the advantage of doing no, no normalization whatsoever. Um, Okay, metrics. So in, in the course of doing a hierarchical clustering, you're going to have to, the, the program's going to have to say it, figure out it many times, how similar are these two samples, or this group of samples with this sample, and so forth. Um, and so you need some way of measuring that. And one is simply the correlation coefficient. And um, this almost always gives the best results. Of all the, there's so many different choices. Um, the next most useful one is Euclidean distance, just the sum of squares of differences. So you just, um, you, if you think of these as points in multidimensional space, it's just the distance, like we were looking at in two-dimensional space, the distance between points. So, so this is simply you just take 
like all the gene, the, you know, the, the vector for one um, sample and the vector for another, you subtract, square each one, and add it all up. Sum of squares. That's Euclidean distance. And then take the square. That's Euclidean distance. Um, here's an example where, where it actually does make sense, and, and I do this. Uh, I use Euclidean. I'm clustering numbers that represent a methylation fraction, and are so there. These numbers are always between zero and one. And even if I have two samples that are perfectly correlated with one another, if one has um, uh, you know, very high values, like around 0.9, and the other has very low values, around 0.1, I'm usually not that interested. I mean, the, the fact that they, they vary together is not as interesting to me as the fact that one is very highly methylated and one is very lowly methylated. So there I'd use Euclidean distance, not correlation. Um, and there are many other metrics in use, and like it says here, I've never figured out what they're good for. I've never found an example where anything other than these two was the best for me. Um, okay, so how do you make that dendrogram? Well, uh, one method, and is almost always used, is the agglomeration method. And it works like this. You kind of start off by, you have all of these samples. And you call each sample a cluster in and of its own right. It's a cluster of one. And you say, OK, now I want to find the two clusters that are closest to each other. So you, you look at each pair. You see, oh, these two are the closest. So those two I'm going to form into a new cluster. So I have all the singletons and these, this new cluster which has two things in it. Then when I, as an example, now, now I'm going to figure out the distance from every cluster to every other one, but this cluster has two things in it. So what, what one method called average linkage is just I'm going to take the average distance from this cluster, the, the one sample in this cluster to, to the samples in this cluster. So I just take those average of those differences and I say that's the distance from this cluster to that cluster. Um, and similarly, there's this thing called complete linkage, which is taking the maximum distance of over, over all the pairs. Uh, and single linkage, which is the minimum distance of all the pairs. Like eventually, as you're building your way up, you'll have clusters with many samples in each of them. So you're going to be taking all pairs and doing either average or max or min. Um, <coughs> now there's another procedure, uh, well no, okay, so that's the, the agglomeration method, you keep, where, where you, you have a bunch of clusters, you find the two that are closest to each other, and you make them into a new cluster, and you keep doing that until you've made everything into one cluster, and that's how you get your hier hierarchy. So that's the agglomeration method, and we're talking about these methods of determining the closest. And um, yeah, so there's you work on that yeah. and I'm going to try to remember yeah I think okay so th there's another very popular way um, that's called thank you that's called uh, the ward cluster and I don't remember if that's just a metric or it's a it's a a, a, a separate I, I've ha I have it under here under your method of determining closest. But anyway, the, the basic idea of ward 
is that it, um, when it's trying to decide which clusters to put together, it doesn't use just the distance between them. It also, or it bakes into that distance, um, some measure of how evenly uh, numerous they are. So it's it, it likes to, it likes to put together, excuse me, clusters that are roughly the same size. So then you so um, let's see. Yeah. So this is an example where we have no normalization here, and I and I've used average linkage. And you get these things where you, you keep kind of adding, like if you start here with this cluster, you add one, and then you add one, and then you add a cluster that has two, but then you go on adding small small clusters, and you get these kind of um, cascades. Whereas you may have wanted things to be more grouped. And so if that's the case, if you want them to be more, more grouped, you can use ward clustering instead of um, average linkage. <coughs> so what I usually do if I, you know, just get a data set and um, you know, just want to take a quick look at it, I'll, I'll use the top 2,000 genes by standard deviation. I use correlation for the metric, and I'll cluster it in two ways. I'll use, I'll, I'll apply median polish to kind of emphasize differences, and I'll use average linkage, and then second two is no normalization in the word clustering. Uh, okay. And another detail. Actually, there's something I should have added to this um, about clustering, which is that um, I used to always do this. Whenever I'd get a new data set, I'd do this. But now with a, a sing single cell technologies, we can have um, you know, a thousand or two thousand samples. And it's actually very unwieldy. You can't see anything. You can't, uh, you can't make any sense out of, out of one of those, um, you know, the dendrograms with the plot. Uh, everything's too small. It's just too much data to see. So what's very popular um, is to reduce the dimensions um, and, and kind of just display it in two dimensions using software, a method called TISNY. I don't know if people have heard of that. Um, and uh, and there's, there's things that you do before you do TISNY. I, I apologize. I, I should have put this in here because this is now something that's done uh, quite often. And, it, and there's a good reason to do it. It's basically when you have 1,000 or plus samples, it's the only way you can really look at the data and, and see it. The, the, the kind of things I've been showing are just too full of tiny stuff. Okay. Um, but another uh, important thing to know about clustering is a consensus clustering. And so that kind of stems from the question, Okay, I did this clustering, and I can see that there's this group, and that group, and that group. Um, is this a big story? I mean, are there real differences here? Or is this maybe just some per peculiarity of the data that came out this way? If the data were slightly different, would it come out some other way? So that's important to know. Um, the idea of consensus clustering is when you re repeatedly remove 20% of the samples and recluster. Um, and so for, for yeah, but let me just also say that another, another part of this is the notion that, so I remove some of the samples and then I cluster, but I cluster in a supervised fashion. So I say to the clustering algorithm, give me two clusters, give me three clusters, give me four, five, six, seven, up to some, maybe up to 20 clusters. And then I remove a different 20% and I do this again. And, and then I, for each pair of samples, I ask the question, when, when both of them were in the game, when both of them did not get removed, and I said, give me three sample, uh, give me three clusters, 
did these two end up in the same cluster or not? And so that, that fraction, which goes between 1 and 0, is, um, uh, is a, a matrix that, that, that if you look at by eye, it tells you a lot about how stable um, is the clustering you're getting. If it's very stable, they'll either, two samples will either always be in the same or never be in the same cluster. So it'll be one, ones and zeros, it'll be a very stark difference. If it's all washed out, it means that this is not a stable numbers of, number of clusters. So here's some example. Um, this is unfortunately fake data, but anyway, let's think of these as samples, and these as genes, and I, I've created um, fake data with four obvious clusters, 14 clusters, and one cluster. And um, there's an R package called Consensus Cluster Plus, and I use that for this. And I took, uh, let's see, what did I do? I forgot, sorry. I think, did you specify the parameter to get how many clusters? Like yeah, so um, I, I, I suspect that we're, we're losing a little bit in projection. But anyway, so I, what we're looking at here is the data where there were four clusters in the data. So this fake data I made that actually we know the answer. It should be four. So um, let's look over here first. So when we tell it that there's three, and we do that pro procedure I discussed where you repeatedly take out randomly 20% and you tell, say then give me three clusters and then you check you know, whether this sample and this sample are in the same and you plot what percentage of time they are and um, you see you have this a bunch of pairs that are not always together or always apart. They're sometimes together, sometimes apart. That's why this is not white or dark purple, but light purple. This is almost dark purple, but not fully dark. So that's, that's the more of that kind of stuff you have, the more it's saying, well, three is probably not your best answer here for how many clusters there are. Um, there's some of that going on here, too, although it looks pretty good at two. But it looks gorgeous at four. Right? I mean, that, that's that's saying there's four here. But this is often the case that when you go above it, when you say give me five, and you do that thing that I just described, and you plot them, it looks like four, although that there's here. So in other words, you asked for five, it came back and said no four. Um, so five what is if, not right. What if four is the right answer, and you put an eight? Will it take those four and divide them further into eight, or will you still see the four predominant ones in the C like? That weird strikingness in the. the um, you'll see, you, you'll see weirdness. Okay. You should. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and so again, this data was too. This was too easy. I mean, because it's really just to keep saying four over and over again is the answer. Um, but. And let me say, in case you're thinking of it, there are proposed ways of automatically looking at these numbers and saying how one zero-ish are they, right? Remember, that's the best. If they're all ones or zeros, that's the best. So how one Z and zero E are they? Um, I have played with this stuff for a, a, good, a good bit of time and never got something that was uh, in real world data that, um, I never found an automatic method among those proposed or those that I thought of that really nailed it. So nowadays I just look at it and, and, and decide based on what I, what I see. Um, let's see, what is this one? I think this is the one with 14, yeah. And what, what happens here is k equals 2, you get, no, that's k equals 2. So you have a lot of this non one zero we stop k equals 3, more, 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 although it, it's eventually at k equals 14, it's quite happy, 
and then as you go higher, it sticks it, it sticks to 14. You really want it to be 14. And then this is when I take the data that has no structure whatsoever, just random noise, and throw it in, and you see that you never get any one zero we type things. So saying that clustering is not there's no clusters here. This is a, there's no structure. This is just Okay, um, so there are actually two packages that um, you're going to be doing this in a practical, yeah. that you'll be playing with in the practical. Um, later on I have a slide which says it should be one package. Uh, I apologize for that, but it's uh, a big project to put them together, but it really should be one package. But anyway, here's one package is called BSW plus 10, and it makes these kinds of plots. There's another package called BSW heat, heat standing for heat map, and this was um, uh, motivated by my experiences working on a paper with David Miyamoto that eventually got published in Science. Uh, this was a figure from that paper. Um, I must have made 50 versions of this thing. I mean, it, it, we went round and round and round and round. Um, so you know. First, before we submitted, and then after the reviewers came and asked for more. And then, so, um, I, I was putting this stuff together kind of by hand, and then when it was done, I said, That was so painful, I'm going to write a package so that I never have to do this again. So, I wrote a package that could output stuff like this. Um, and this, too, I guess, was part of that same thing. Okay, so as I said, um, it should be one package, um, and it, you know the package should be in CRAN so that you can be sure it would always be there. But it's all a lot of work. Um, and by the way, there are two competing packages <coughs> which did not exist when I made mine, but now they do, um, and are very popular. And people get good results with them, especially if you now. So if you want stuff that's kind of out there and uh, not you know so local to our own group or um, those are things you can look at instead and I really have not looked at them enough to know uh, well I know a little bit about them. can't help you too much with them okay um, a few a few things about this package when you use it like this would be maybe a default way you would throw up your um, your your first look at some data, and <clears throat> you might say, oh, look, there's a whole bunch of things that are appear to be, say, down-regulated up here. What are they? Um, you can make a tall version of this plot and then scroll around in it. And in the tall version, you get um, you know, the names of the genes, and you can see that. So that's one thing you can do with it. Um, I'm going to say this now in case you all actually use this package. Um, for many years, and as far as I know still, there's a bug in Adobe Reader, uh, which has the, has the consequence that if you take a very big plot, uh, it just gives you white. It just won't show you the big plot. I don't know why. Um, Macintosh Preview doesn't have that issue, but Adobe Reader does. So there's a all these in all these packages. There's this thing called GEX, um, and you can set that to 0.25. It makes everything just shrinks by to a quarter of what it was, and Adobe Reader will not show it to you. So I'll just say that in case you run into it. <coughs> Also, if you want to like kind of be interactively playing with stuff in an R graphics window, this GX can make it fit as well. This is an example uh, of BSW heat output. Um, you know, you basically you give it your matrix of, of well, various types of matri <coughs> matrices you can give it. Here, I've given it a numeric matrix, and then I give it 
have you, you, you guys been doing R? Yeah, these are R packages. So you give it a data frame giving information like, in this case, I give it information about each column, which is its PR status or ER status or HER2 status, whether it's normal or cancer. This is actually TCGA data. And um, I was very pleased with myself when I took all this TCGA data, which I think many people know is just a big database of gene expression. And I threw it in there and boom, it plotted it. And it, this plot, this is just the normal. I mean, there's a, over a thousand samples that goes out in that direction. Um, but it, you know, it breaks it up in the way that biologists like to break stuff, the line and these things. So. so the best way, I believe, to learn these packages is to just kind of look at these examples that are in these two um, files and, and run them and, and see how, uh, you know, what changes from example to example and how does that affect the output. Um, and reading the comments is, is necessary as well, I believe. And that's the best way to learn. Um, <coughs> for the cluster package, there's this thing here, which I'm not sure it's readable. Maybe it is if you have this uh, as a PowerPoint on your, on your screen. But it gives um, kind of the uh, nomenclature I used so that you might be able to understand the help better if you if you know that nomenclature. Okay, now a few a few other things to mention about these packages that are a little unusual. In clustering, creating a plot is a, is a two-step process. Um, the first pro the first thing you do is is do the cluster, so that that de the dendrogram or the dendrograms gets computed. And then you plot as a second step. And the reason, you know, why is this a two-step process? The reason is um, clustering can sometimes take a while. So after you've waited for five minutes for your clustering to get done, which it may happen if, if it's a really big data set, um, you don't want to wait every five minutes and then you plot it, and then there's something you know a little wrong with the plot. So you want to fiddle with the plot parameters and make it you know, wider, narrower, add in more uh, you know gene names or something. You don't want to have to recluster every time. Um, so you cluster once, and then you can plot, 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 plot until you're happy. Um, there's also, and you'll see, you'll see this in the examples, a function called BSW plus plot to file. And um, it's not the R way to have a function of this nature. So um, as you probably know by now, um, in R, you tend to just say plot. And then you can be plotting to your screen, or you can be plotting to a file. And there are various types of files. So you do plot, plot this, plot that, plot this, plot that. It's all going into your plot. And then you, like if you're, if you're trying to make a, a PDF file, you'll start, you'll say, start this PDF file. Plot, 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 plot. End the PDF file. And now it's a PDF file you can look at. It's got all your stuff in it. Um, that's, not what, that's not the way this works. And the reason is, you may have noticed this already in R. When you plot things, and then you, let's say, make your window more narrow, all the graphics kind of squeezes. But the text doesn't squeeze. So all of a sudden, your text doesn't fit anymore. And um, this interplay between the graphics and the text can be maddening. If you want to get a nice, let's say, you know, a nice plot that you might even put in a publication, you can't have the text all over it, squeezed all over itself. Just and and this can make you crazy trying to, to trying to figure out okay how why and the same thing is true as you like you can change the window on your screen and things change. You also have to like change the size of the PDF output file, and you have to experiment to see what width gives me the makes my graphics look the way I want. But 
then what about the text and so forth? It's just, it's just a nightmare. So the solution that I've come up with is that BSW plus plots everything in terms of inches and, and points, which are 70 seconds of an inch used for text. text is, uh, the size of text is measured in points, which are 70 seconds of an inch. So what BSW plus does is by default, all text is, I forget, whatever, 8 point or 10 point, 12 point, or whatever it is, but, and also by default, the size of a, of a, of a cell is 0 0.2 inches, which makes just enough room for your text to fit nicely. And then you plot, and as you, you kind of, it, it, you can think of it as it starts in the middle, and it decorates, so it, it, makes, it makes that heat map in the middle, but then it puts things on the top and the side, and it works its way out, and it says, oh, I'm done. Now let me see how big this was. And it figures out how big it was. It makes a PDF file of that size, and it plots it, put, putting it in the right place, so it's much easier um, for, for the user. Okay, one last comment about BSW Clust. Um, is that most of the arguments that you might need to play with, most of the arguments to this function are found in the help page for this function, because of your plot. Um, so first, let me just say that you know there are help for all these functions that you'll that you'll be learning about in the examples. Um, but like one thing that people like beginners tend to ignore is they'll have, they'll see there are four arguments to this function. Two that are required and two that are optional, and then there's this dot dot dot. People often will like ignore the dot dot dot. But in this case, the dot 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 is crucial. If you look at the documentation of the dot dot dot, it says extra arguments that get passed to bswclus.plot. So if you want to look up those, see what all those arguments are, you have to do the help for that now, okay? And the, and the reason I do it this way is so that I don't, I don't have to document things twice, which often things then get out of, out of sync with each other. So if I put a new argument in BSW plot, it's automatically going to be in BSW plot to file, because BSW plot to file is going to call BSW plot. So that's, that's why that works. BSW heat um, is similar, but <clears throat> I don't know if you if you re noticed or recall from that the the plot that motivated this package. Um, some some of the rows were numeric, some of them were um, just you know mutated, not don't have enough data, you know. Some so. There was a, a big mixture of things in, in that plot. And so at the lowest level, there's this thing called bswheat.color, which, which means you pass it a matrix of colors. And it will plot them and separate them and label them for you. But you have to tell it what colors. Now there's also bswheat.numeric, where you pass it a numeric matrix. It figures out a color matrix you know, with the, with the um, color ramps and so forth. And then it takes that color matrix and it passes it to BSW heat.color. So plot this for me and decorate it. So, and then this BSW heat.pdf is the same thing as plot to file was in, in the sense that it plots, sees how big it is, it makes the paper just the right size. But this one we'll call this one, or this one we'll call, which we'll call that one, or this one we'll call that one directly. So again, you have the same, same issue. When you want to learn what are the arguments, uh, what do they mean if you want to look them up, you, you have to realize that those dot, dot, dots mean something. And this function's dot, dot, dots will take it here or here. So you may have to look up there. Um, I'll, oops. Um, one other comment is that I recently added to the examples a little consensus clustering. And this package does consensus clustering as well as the package I use to make this, 
no, uh, no. I don't mean to say as well. I mean to say, even though I used the package, I forget what package I used, uh, called consensus cluster plus, PSW plus also has consensus clustering in it. And for my, I use my own. There is this hard part of it. Any questions? Oh, I mean, just to finish up, as we said, Vishal will take you through a practical so you can work through those examples and be on your way to making plots. Any questions? Anything? Any suggestions? Thank you, Ben. Sure. Uh, all right, people, let's thank Okay, everybody in here, can I close the door? No, there's Daniel. Huh? Daniel's still out. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to close the door. Because the, apparently there's some sort of alarm that goes off, and then they show up, the security people. That would be So, um, so we just learned a little bit about heat maps and uh, Ben's package and uh, how to install it and everything we'll see in a second. Uh, but let me walk you first, walk you guys through first the DC tutorial. Then we're going to do some installation of the heat map package. And this is essentially the um, file that you will download. And you can download, do this while I'm talking here. You can download, go to Intro to Bioinformatics, and there you should have two um, uh, sections. There's one for analysis and differential expression, and that's where you get today's code, the count tables, the PowerPoint, and everything. And uh, the other one is under heat maps. You get Ben's uh, lecture and uh, Ben's uh, tutorial and everything. Okay. So, uh, so. <coughs> Let me just show you what I'm talking about here. Basically, go here and okay. I guess everybody's on the side. Uh, when you download this, there's a zip file that basically says 2018 materials.zip, and that should be under um, the unit for different analysis and differential expression on the web. Um, Wait, what is it called? Um, it's called analysis and differential expression. The file? Uh, the, no, the unit. So if I was to here, let me just go back here. Um, it should be analysis. Obviously, this site is does not support the bandwidth of the, you know ten students at the same time. So, uh, pardon me. Then again, I'm supporting this personally on my resources and not through MTA. So this is the best I can do right now. Um, okay. That said, um, this there should be this analysis DEC and analysis and differential expression unit. Are you seeing that? Yeah, it was just it was called 2017 advice. Okay, so yeah, so that's, does that matter? Does not matter. So this is what it's called. This is called analysis for Differ differential expression in R, mm -hmm. right? And then there is this heat map and counting. So this is my back end, which I can see. These are just the names that you will see <coughs> as hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. They'll be called heat maps and counting. Under heat maps and counting, you will see a module uh, which will have Ben's, uh, uh, you know, lecture and materials for his package. And then there's also this thing for under this you will see that there's a zip file for download, which will which is you have to download that for your practical. When you download that, it will show up as this 2018 DC materials.zip. Okay. When you unzip it, wherever you download, that's the directory where you need to work from. And that's where you have four things in here. You have today's um, 
today's uh, presentation, which is a practical summary of what we're going to be doing in the practical. Then there is this uh, FA 2018DC tutorial R file. So this is the far file that you will be opening with our studio to work with today. Uh, and that is right here, our studio. Um, I will be, and I'll be, you know, guiding you. Basically, I'll be going over the code and everything. Uh, you won't be doing this. You'll be doing it on your own, at your own time, maybe tomorrow or at home. So, so in, in order to save you some time. Um, and then this is a raw counts read file. Uh, so, here, again, show you what it looks like. Sort of like this. It has all these samples from 1 to 15. Uh, these are all the samples that I uploaded for you guys earlier. So if you had lined them and you had followed the steps to create the matrix, uh, it would look somewhat like this. Okay. Um, do you remember I uploaded these data in your temp directory for you to work through as part of your exercises <coughs> which we started early on? You would be then downloaded data RNA seq for fall 2018 because the folder long time ago and I said that you know while you are working through this do the QC then do the alignments then get the counts and then join those counts well this is the output of joining all those counts <laughs> okay so in case you didn't do it which I suspect most of you didn't which is totally fine I understand that this would what this is what you would have gotten in the end all right <coughs> so just to keep things consistent in case you did it kudos to you you should have a file that looks like this. Uh, it may not have all these samples, but it will definitely have, you know, I think I uploaded all the samples, but you know, this is what it looks like. So it has gene names as rows, and then as columns, you have these samples. Each sample is one column, okay? So that's the kind of matrix that you get after running it. Uh, and then finally, there is this information sheet which talks about what is this experiment, so what is this data about? It's like a meta file. And so this file has, you know, the name of the sample, the condition it represents. So these are, this is a time course experiment uh, where you are adding something at some concentration. So there is none, which is a control. Then there is a medium concentration, high concentration, and low concentration. Okay. So we're going to be looking at this and then doing some comparisons between the high concentration condition and the none or the control uh, today in our practical. Uh, that said, we'll also be talking about uh, how to do and differential expression using this. Uh, but all of these four things are available, so this is all you need to run this piece of code that uh, we'll be talking about today. All right, so let's quickly go ahead and start um, and just you know walk you through this. Um, so, so one hour practical step by step to go through the DC code. I can either do this tomorrow, or um, you can do it on your own depending on how things go. Uh, but don't worry if you don't, you know, if you all, if you feel like you want me to do it tomorrow, I'll be happy to do it. We don't have to do GSC. Either way, we have class tomorrow. Okay. Um, so here are some useful websites. Uh, this thing has the bioconductor RNA seq pipeline. So if, for example, to now you've been doing stuff but you are not yet, you know, comfortable, there's an entire <coughs> RNA seq pipeline apart from what I have just taught you, available on this link on bioconductor. Uh, so last week some of you were here, so you realized that I was talking about Bioconductor. Bioconductor is a semi-universe of packages that are offered uh, just for bioinformatics in R. So, it, so while R is a universe of everything um, in terms of doing stuff with R, so like there is financial software in R, there is mathematical modeling software, there is statistical software, um, Bioconductor is a sub-universe where it just has bioinformatics software. Okay. So if you go to bioconductor.org, it also has useful links, like workflows, for example, there's this RNA seq pipeline workflow. So highly recommend that if you have time and you want to do stuff just in R long term, this is a good resource. Uh, again, DEC is a portion of our pipeline, so what the way we've studied so far, our pipeline works, I'll show you. Uh, but DEC comes in where we're trying to do, you know, once we're, we've, we have our counts and we want to now do differential expression. So, again, if you want to use DEC, you have to read this, uh, the, both this link and if you want to go deeper than the paper. But at the very least, you want to go through the vignette 
and there's something called as DEC tutorial, which is different from the vignette. Okay, so those are both links online. Um, this is more for people who intend to use this right now for their analysis. If you're here to just, you know, do this practical, you may not need to read this in detail, but at a certain point, uh, you know, I assume that you took this course because you wanted to do your own differential expression analysis and stuff. So when you reach that point, I would recommend you to read this because again, last week we talked about the theory and we talked about the concepts, we talked about a lot of things um, which I basically took from here, okay? So, um, okay, so that's, with that said, uh, this is where we are biologically. We took our samples, you know, treated the samples. Some we, we have our controls. We have our uh, treatment samples. We extract RNA, make cDNA ligand adapters, throw those samples on the sequencer. Then we follow our computational pipeline after we get the sequencing data. We did our QC. We did the alignment. We did the HTC where we got a count table, and now we're at the seq. And after that. Uh, either tomorrow or next week, we're going to do GSC at gene set enrichment, um, followed by some biological insights. So that pretty much would complete our RNA seq pipeline. All right. So this is what we're going to do today. Uh, last week we talked about the theory for DE seq. We'll cover some of this again today, just as a refresher, as part of this practical. Um, but if you haven't yet watched the video, I'd highly recommend you go back and do that. That will help you understand things more. Um, so what does DE seq do? Well, it helps you identify genes that are different between user-defined groups. So you choose what your groups are. Once you define your samples belonging to a certain group, then you can compare and find out what genes are different between one group, group compared to another. Okay? Um, and the DC2 package provides a method to test for differential expression um, by use of a negative binomial generalized linear model. So again, last week I talked about so a little bit about distributions. Um, the, the underlying assumption of the seq2 package is that we, our data is distributed and modeled by negative binomial uh, distribution. Okay, the EdgeR package similarly uses another distribution. It uses something called as a Poisson distribution as its underlying model. Okay. So the estimates of dispersion and log, log fold change incorporate data-driven prior distributions. So we'll try to understand this once again um, uh, when we go through this. Don't worry, you have to do So basically, there are three steps that it performs. First thing is that it adjusts individual samples for library size or sequencing depth. This is what you call as a size factor or your standard normalization step, right? It's very similar to reads per million. DC has its own way of adjusting for size, okay? Then it does something called as it estimates the variance or dispersion of each gene. So this is the step that we um, talked at length last time that, you know, uh, what do you mean by variance, that what is the dispersion, which is another word for variance. So it tries to estimate for every single gene across all the samples, what is the variance of that gene. Then it runs a statistical test to see which genes are differentially expressed between two groups. So for every single gene, it goes and walks through and does a statistical test um, uh, and tries to find out which genes are different. Um, and then followed by some other steps like multiple hypothesis correction and all that. Okay. Uh, so, now, um, last week the homework was to install DSeq on your computers, and uh, these are uh, some of the steps that you can follow to install DSeq. Uh, I also sent an email with detailed instructions. Uh, did, were people successfully able to do that, or did people have a lot of problems? Is it running for most of you or no? So, who, who, if any of you has not been able to do it, um, can you make sure you tell me later on so that I can go with you, go over with you if you had any issues? Otherwise, can I just assume that everybody was able to install it? Okay. All right. Uh, so for today, um, like I said, these are not the files. These are actually. So, okay, so full disclaimer, Mark made this uh, presentation <laughs> a while ago, um, and this is his data. Uh, but, you know, since he's, since then, he was a student, but he made this, and then after that, uh, <laughs> I, I've been, you know, teaching this uh, the presentation. It's, it's really just a very nice way to present. Okay, so the first few things we do with our uh, count is to load your count matrix, which is uh, this file, 
not this one, this file into R. All right. So the first few statements um, in our presentation loads our data. So that's our first 33 lines right here. We start here. Um, so the first thing you do here is you're loading your. Um, so I'm going to walk you through this while we're doing this. All right. So just pay attention, and then you can execute all of this. So. The first thing we do is we need these packages, so library, ggplots, color brewer, dbc2, genefilter, flyer. Now, here is the package, ESWClust, which won't run yet because you have to install it. Everything else, you should be working apart from this package. Everything else should be there. If it doesn't work, you can either do install.packages, so remove this comment and just type this in your command line, and technically it should work. You just you know, install your package, Venn diagram, if it doesn't exist. All right, um, and then other than that, if uh, everything else works, then if this is the only thing, then um, I will tell you just about in a few minutes how to do this. Okay, so um, the, the line here, you're just getting the system date here, putting it in a variable. Uh, we set our working directory to where <coughs> we have downloaded the file. So I downloaded this folder in this long path. So this is where I store my stuff, in my home directory, I have a workspace folder, MGH, bioinformatics, blah, blah, blah. If you just want to store it in downloads, that totally, that's totally fine. Just make sure that your path is correct. Okay? So by now, I hope everybody understands the importance of path, so make sure that's correct. Uh, once you've set that, you can just go ahead and you set the working directory, uh, which is what we're doing here. Then following that, you read the file into a, this variable called data. Now, uh, once you've read that, you can do a head on to see how that data looks like. It should look like this, where you have all these samples, okay? And then you have some counts for those samples. Um, so I do a couple of things here. There, are, there, there is a way for us to remove certain uh, uh, rows in this matrix. So there are certain rows in this matrix, specifically the last few. So if I was to do a tail, tail, uh, just like head, tail is a function that helps me find out. Uh, so there are, so this is the last gene or last feature I want. Apart from that, these are all output from uh, HTC that I don't want included in my, uh, in my uh, matrix, right? Because these are just no features or ambiguous or all of these. So what I do is I create a row and I put down the names of stuff that I, uh, that I want to delete, including something called as ERCC uh, reads. So ERCC is a control uh, which is usually added to, to experiments, to, uh, but most of the times we don't end up using this. Uh, and for our analysis, we don't need the ERCC controls, so I'm just going to remove those. And the reason I remove these is because these features usually have a lot of counts. For example, uh, there is like two, two million uh, no features here. And if, if I don't remove it, the DC package was just going to think that this is a gene. And it's going to normalize for this as well. And that's going to create a huge bias in my normalization. So I want to remove all these, this uh, considerate junk. Okay. So the way I do that is I add the things like the names of no feature, alignment not unique, all of this as strings in this vector. And then I go ahead and I say row sums called the supply function. So I search for each of these with the grepl function in the row names of data. And if I find it, then I store that value, that row number in drop. So that's what this line is doing. OK? Um, and then I go ahead and say data is data not drop, which means that anything else that is there, just keep that and just remove the drop rows. OK? And that changes my thing. So. Actually, just as an example, I'm going to do this again to show you that the dimensions of how many rows. So if you look at the dimensions of data, it's 59,171. And now I'm going to do the drop. Uh, and again, let's look at the dimensions again. Uh, and that is now it's 59,074. <coughs> So there's approximately 90, uh, 96 or 97 rows that were deleted from our matrix. OK? All right? OK. Um, following that, the next thing I want to do is I want to add uh, the information from the 
uh, from the sample info file, which just tells me what all is uh, there and what this what sample belongs to what. All right. So right here, um, I'm taking my. Here, I'm going to just make this a little higher. So I'm taking my sample and adding the metadata for that. Okay. All right. Um, let me go here. So so this we've done this. And now we load and prep our metadata, which includes the condition, time, experiment number. Um, so you can also manually input this data into R, so you can create your own data frame and your own vectors. Uh, but it's just a lot easier to make this in Excel and read it in. <laughs> okay? All right. Uh, so that's the, these lines 35 to 37. Um, at which point you go ahead and select which samples you will be analyzing. So sometimes you may only want to analyze a portion of your data. Here we select eight samples of the initial 15. Um, and that is basically how you subset your data, all right? So let's say you only want to compare the high samples to the low or the high to the control, right? So you can just select those samples and then um, uh, you can also select the metadata that comes with each of those samples and that's what we're doing here. So first we're gonna just create these as factors. Uh, by now, um, I hope you understand what factors are, but if not, Again, just um, intuitively, if you look at sample info, um, you've got your condition, your hour, and your experiment. So how many factors does experiment have? It has two. What are those factors? There's experiment one and experiment two, right? One and two. And similarly for hour, how many factors does hour have? It has unique values one and three. So it has two factors. Their values are one and three, all right? Um, okay. So we take those and you know we need those for later, so we're just going to factorize them now and store them as vectors in here. Um, next, we're going to assign the rows that we want. So we want the rows 8 to 15, so we're going to call these take these, and we're going to create a vector with the name take these. So if you just print that out, all it is is this set of numbers 8 to 15. Okay. And we're going to subset that by saying data, comma, take these, which is the number of names of the columns that we want. Okay? All right. Uh, just take a pause here. How many of you are still with me? How many of you are lost? Questions? Any questions? It's okay if you have questions. Clear? Sort of clear? Okay. All right. Uh, so what we did here we, was we select the data. Now our sample data includes our columns from the data that we want. Just to confirm, we can do a head and see sample underscore data, and sure enough, it has all our samples from eight to fifteen. Okay. It's a smaller data set. All right. Um, so then the next lines, forty-two to forty-five, we also just select the metadata, the experiment which are exactly the same uh, for those conditions, all right? Uh, same thing with our, um, yeah. okay. So now, um, here's an optional thing, and I think it's, actually I think it should be mandatory, but it just, even if you don't do it, it still works, but, so DEC2 automatically removes low count rows to remove the power. So what, um, here's an important concept to understand. Um, whenever you run these analysis, the, the more rows you have in your analysis that have higher number of reads or higher sequencing depth, the better your software is in detecting um, genes that are differentially expressed. Does that make sense? Right? So um, one thing we do to increase statistical power or to have, you know, to avoid having rows that are just zeros and ones. Uh, is to filter them out early on. Now, DC does that for you as well, but what we're going to um, do manually is just remove low count rows to increase power. Okay, so we do that right here in line 46, um, where actually uh, it's actually right here. Right? So, what we're doing is we're saying that uh, any rows that are um, if the, if the row sums, meaning the sum of the reads in that row is greater than the length of the samples, which is eight, so at the very least, each, on average, each gene should have at least one count, which in my opinion is a low threshold, 
right? Ideally, I would say at least two times the length of this would be a decent cutoff to have. All right, so what you're saying is that in a given row, um, how many in this, if you look, look here, in this gene, it doesn't even have a total of eight reads total, right? So how many reads does it have in the first gene? One plus one, two plus one, three. This, read, this row should not be in your data frame. So we eliminate that here by saying that if there is less than eight reads in a row, just remove that, okay? Okay, so that's what we do here. Um, and now um, the next thing after that is um, we want to make sure to specify your control. So DC has no way of knowing what sample is your control sample and what sample is the sample that you want to test uh, as your treatment, all right? So we want to create something called an experimental design, all right? So that is an important step in EC because um, this is where you specify um, what your experiment is to DC. So by default, it will uh, <laughs> default to alphabetical order. Therefore, you should use a re-level function to specify your reference level or explicitly order your levels. So let's just go here and see what's going on here. So we're selecting our experimental design in this statement. And um, if you look here, um, it's creating a data frame with our current columns and the conditions um, of, that we have, so here. So what we did was we created a data frame where we set our conditions for each sample. So these two are none, these two are high, these two are medium, these two are low. And then along with our experiment and our, our um, what are those factors for those conditions, okay? So this is very similar to our metadata table. It's just, uh, it's a different way of representing. We're just calling it an experimental design, okay? All right? Am I going too fast? Are you guys with me still? A question. Yes. So previously you had to say like of whatever the data is that we're working on, you had to say like in this file mm -hmm. use this particular column or row name or whatever it was mm -hmm. called. Here you just have like Which you're line? assigning row names equals column names. It is just assuming that it's from like condition equals condition. Are you already assuming that it's from File. Um, like condition, so I've already made this vector as condition. Oh, okay. So it's got it's, it. it's going to take this condition and just replace it with this. Got it. The super logical naming yeah. of things. Is and that's this experiment is going to be this experiment. Gotcha. This hour here is going to be this hour. Gotcha. So you already did that basically. Yeah. So you just I, assign them as I, I just, vectors to make your exactly. life easier. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This is just create your vectors early on. So that when you're finally creating a data frame, you don't have to type out your entire statement here, like, oh, sample info, take these columns right. with what is what. Correct. All right? Mm -hmm. So we do that beforehand, and then we create our design like this. OK? Um, all right? So um, OK, following that, I think the next thing we want to do is you want to factor your condition and specify the levels that you want to have here. So um, we know that right now we're testing for our, um, uh, for our condition in our experiment, which is this guy. So we want to make sure that explicitly right now it's just a data frame. It doesn't have a, a factor associated with the condition vector. So what we did was that we said, OK, we've got to explicitly make factors. And we want the factors to be in this <laughs> order, which is none, high, medium, low, like that. And uh, sorry, none, low, medium, and high. Um, and that's what we specify by saying our order is this. Now let's say, supposing we don't specify our levels. Uh, for a second, I'm just going to eliminate that. And just to show you what happens is that it can creates these levels alphabetically in that case. Um, thought it would contain, can create them using those uh, experimental. <coughs> right, so you can see here now, um, when I create the condition vector, 
it has the uh, order as high, low, medium, none. So that's our first, the first time we create this, the levels are in alphabetical order. Now why is the order of those levels important? Um, it is important because DEC, when it does the comparison, um, it does, so in this case, if supposing we were to choose the comparison between high and low, it would use the second one as a numerator and the first one as the denominator. And it chooses that based on the order and the rank in the levels. So ideally, if you wanted high to be in the numerator, you would want that to be the second one. So you want low, high as a, the second uh, order. And we'll come to that in a second when we go down further and do the differential expression. I'll show you what it means. Okay? For now, just know that uh, uh, whatever order you want, you want to specify that early on in, in, in the way you want it to be. Okay, so I'm just going to do this here. And now the condition should be back in our order that we want. We want the order to be non low, medium, high. Okay? All right. Uh, Next thing, so this is where we start using DEC. <coughs> and the way we start using it is we call DEC data set from matrix. We pass it our sample data, we pass it our experimental design, and we pass it this condition vector that we just created using our factor. Right? And the way we do that um, is we say that here, the column data is our entire design, experimental design, but uh, the actual design, what we want to test today, is our condition vector, which is this guy. So we want to test our conditions, meaning that we want to really run the differential expressions based on the condition uh, uh, vector of our data frame, uh, which is, uh, in a, because in the entire data frame is this one, sorry, this guy right here. Well, what we want from this data frame, we're not testing the experiment, uh, our actual design to test is our condition, okay? So that has to defi be defined early on. And we do that in this statement when we're saying create a, a DEC object from a matrix using this data. Okay. So why do I get this error? Anybody? Because I don't have it loaded. Yes, because I don't have it loaded. So in order for this to work, I need to obviously load DEC. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go ahead and load all these packages, uh, which I'll need as part of this practice including BSW plus 10. In my case, I've installed everything, so technically it works perfectly fine. Um, okay. Don't you need to have a PLYR and P heat map? I did install in, those. Huh? No, but in the uh, not brackets, but the, uh, uh, It actually works both ways. So oh, you okay. could have them in brackets, it'll still work. Okay. Um, so I think it's more about for convenience if you like the brackets. Sometimes, you know, you miss those, it doesn't really penalize you for that. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create our DC data object. We just created that, and uh, boom, it works fine. This is our DDS object. Oops. Okay, so I think it started doing the RLD step. So let me explain to you what's going on um, in your thing. So we're generating our DC data set, which requires one line of code, which has DC data set from matrix, your count data, our uh, experimental design from the column data, which is the entire, everything about the, what all is there in the samples, and then our specific design for the condition we want to test today, okay? So these are the three things that we enter. Uh, after entering that, um, let's try and perform some exploratory data analysis. So this is more like a sanity check on our data. We were trying to figure out, do our replicates cluster together? Is there more variation between biological replicates than there is between experimental conditions? So. So again, so DEC helps us uh, go through, uh, before we start doing differential expression, it helps you, there are these functions in there that can help you perform um, a sort of a check as to see how your data was sequenced and was it proper. Um, so it, it basically, you know, to see wh whether your um, um, 